Bonjour à tous. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the session on the all-powerful state. Is that justified by the crisis? I'm going to introduce to very quickly the participants of this roundtable. Chloé Morin, who is an expert in opinion polls. She created her own company. Jean-Louis Giraudot, president of Lazare France. Patrick Mignola, president of the Modem Group at the National Assembly. And Mr. Ben Moussa, who's ambassador of Morocco in France and has been for the past eight years, I believe. We also have two people uh, from a distance, a historian, Mr. Ferguson, who's a professor at Stanford, and Mr. Uh, de la Ferrier, who's uh, an economist and former minister for foreign trade in Mexico. He's just published a book on the economy of extortion. I'll give the floor to Christian Saint-Etienne, who will be introducing the discussion, and then we'll give the floor to our various participants. Thank you very much. Following the health crisis we have already gone through, the states in democratic countries intervened strongly in the economy to organize the fight against the pandemic, stimulate research work on vaccines, and organize, or at least trigger some organization to set up greater strategic autonomy on a national level and more often than not also on a European level. So the question, the key issue is, were uh, these interventions justified? Were they actually rolled out in an appropriate manner? Has the state intervened too much in certain fields and not as enough in others? That's the key question that arises uh, and we'll discuss in this round table. Economic theory has limits and contradictions, but it does make analyses uh, of various uh, mechanisms. In the introductory meeting uh, this afternoon, we saw that uh, the circle of economists is giving great thought to the following. Without uh, innovation in competition and without innovation in competition, things don't move forward. There can be no technical progress or economic progress. We also need, however, a stable uh, global demand. The players have to anticipate that also is provided for an economic theory when almost all players share the same view. This is almost self-fulfilling and that can be for everyone's good. Everyone expects things to go well. That will accelerate economic recovery, for example. But when and people, on the contrary, think it's Armageddon, then they'll think the worst may come about, and it may well be. It may be a self-fulfilling prophecy. So how should the state intervene to stimulate uh, supply, demand, without creating too many rigidities? How, many, how should one create and uh, shape the relationship between states and enterprises without giving an advantage to some enterprises uh, as opposed to others? We have a real issue in France. We have very small, we had very few small companies uh, uh, in the past, so the state grew used to working with huge companies. The state needs to reposition itself to help the uh, SMEs. Also, there is another issue. The fields of state intervention, should the state intervene directly in certain sectors, uh, or should it just organize an economic and fiscal tax and social environment that fosters growth? And then, in this overall context, what about opening up to the international world? We have any number of speakers here, including one from the US, and that's very important for us. We shouldn't forget that for the last uh, 10 years and for the next 25 years, the history of the world will be dominated by uh, competition between China and the US. The Chinese and American uh, states have special policies which are designed uh, to prolong this latent state of conflict. What should one deduct as European states? How should we organize ourselves? Can we 
work closely together enough to stabilize the conflict, for example. Our various uh, speakers will no doubt shed some light on all these matters. I suggest that uh, we give the floor first to Mr. Ferguson, who will speak as a historian, no doubt, as to the strong power of the state. Uh, we have wondered about uh, this uh, great power acquired and built up by the state. According to the rules here, uh, the questions are put in French. Is this all-powerfulness of the state uh, unjustified or justified? And what do you view as being dangerous? What limits should be imposed on state power? That will be a sort of introduction before we proceed with the debate. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, forgive me for having missed the preliminary discussion. I had a few technical challenges. Uh, let me begin as an historian uh, by thanking you uh, for inviting me. Uh, often uh, economic history has uh, become a poor relation in the academic world, certainly in the United States. Uh, it's no longer loved in economic departments or in history departments. So I'm very honored to be participating in this discussion. Obviously, the idea that in a health emergency, the government should be able to uh, uh, take on emergency powers is not new. It goes back to medieval times when quarantines were developed in the 14th century at the time of the Black Death and early modern times where cordon sanitaire were imposed between territories. It's interestingly, in the 19th century, it was liberal England uh, with its supposed night watchman state that took uh, the most effective steps forward in areas such as public sanitation. So there's clearly a, a tradition of emergency intervention that goes back uh, centuries. One of the interesting questions that, that was put uh, to me in the preparations for this session was whether the powers uh, that have been acquired by states during the COVID-19 pandemic will swiftly uh, be returned or given back. And I think if the great emergencies of the last 100 years are our guide, the answer is no or not quickly. Uh, there is, I think, a, a striking tendency on both sides of the Atlantic for states of emergency, emergency regulations to remain in place after the emergency. This is especially true in the United States, which has over 30 different states of emergency still in force, including one dating back to 1979. I, I think one of the key points I'd like to make is that when one looks at what happened in 2020 and 2021, there was enormous variation in effectiveness between countries, but there was no clear political economy story that one could tell. Unitary states did not do better than federal states. Dictatorships didn't do better than democracies. Uh, highly state uh, uh, or party controlled systems like the Chinese were good at repressing the spread of the virus. But in many ways, the Chinese state was responsible for the origin of the pandemic. And it's striking to me that Chinese vaccines have much lower efficacy than the vaccines developed in more competitive systems where the state played a minimal role uh, in uh, vaccine research. I think we should all bear in mind, as we look back on the past 18 months, Larry Brilliant's formula for a public health emergency, early detection, early action. Brilliant was the epidemiologist who played a role in the elimination of, of smallpox. And I think early detection, early action remains the key to success. It was something that was basically not done in most Western countries. Most European and North American countries failed to meet that standard. A few Eastern countries like Taiwan and South Korea succeeded. And one thing that I would like to emphasize is how much we can learn from looking at Taiwan and, and South Korea's response. 
because it was characterized by both early detection and early action. I don't think, just to conclude my opening remarks, that we're really returning to uh, a time of, of economic planning, uh, though some people think that there's been some permanent shift in the balance of state and market. And of course, the Biden administration loves plans. We have an American rescue plan, an American jobs plan, an American families plan. But I'm very skeptical that the modern bureaucratic state can deliver on such plans, particularly infrastructure plans, uh, with the kind of uh, effectiveness of, let's say, the 1950s federal government. And my expectation is that the backlash against the expansion of state power has already gone some way politically, uh, and that there is now considerable pressure on governments to give back uh, the power that they took during the emergency so that new lockdowns will be very, very difficult to impose, even if the Delta variant causes a great surge of cases on both sides of the Atlantic. So I, I think that the key issue, and this is my final observation, is the speed with which it will be possible to get governments to give up the power that they temporarily uh, acquired and legitimately acquired during the emergency as the emergency comes to a conclusion. And recent political experience tells us that there's a lot of inertia and that bureaucracies are reluctant to give up powers once they've acquired them, even if citizens resent those powers. So I'll leave it there. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Mr. Ferguson has just talked a lot about the health crisis, but when we talk about uh, the strong power of the state, which might be justified by the crisis, um, there are certain gaps, no doubt. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for being here. We've gone through a very special time. As we saw, the state took control of most of the economy and parts of a society, like in a war or a major natural disaster. 2020, state expenditure amounted to 63% of GDP. We already stood at 55 or 56% in France, and now we've reached a record high. Now, what's going to happen now? What should we expect? I think there are three phenomena, three crises, as mentioned, which push the state to act. These crises converge uh, at different moments in time. First of all, we have the health crisis, and I hope we're beginning to emerge from it. It led the state to uh, stop the economy, provide for health and security, take control over some essential supplies, and ensure what Edmund Phelps, the Nobel Economics Prize, said uh, the state took over the systemic side of things, the economy from the supply side, for example, in France, uh, the, we have the support system for the economy. And on the demand side, uh, there was furloughing of workers and various additional measures. It went pretty far, because in the country, we have not just uh, additional uh, welfare measures uh, to prop up uh, weakened players. This was uh, a short-term emergency measures. There are other two crises which have created a lot of demand on the state. We have the geopolitical crisis born of the decoupling, as Christian Satyajian said, between China and the US. The long period of convergence it began with Nixon's trip and reached a peak when China joined WTO. And now China, which was the workshop of the world, is becoming a military and technology power that is competing with the US. And there's been a ramping up of protectionism and mistrust. Hence, this causes, raises the issue of more state intervention in the area of uh, investment and technological independence and uh, industrial policy. And then there's a third crisis, globalization, which in the Western world, uh, has led to the destruction of the middle class. You know the elephant-shaped curve, uh, where we saw that the Western middle class has been the real victim of globalization. Trumpism, Brexit, uh, we had the gilets jaunes, the yellow jackets, 
and uh, the state has ramped up protectionism, isolationism, and also uh, uh, income policy or uh, has become fashionable. In the U.S., there was a fear that the economy would overheat and push up salaries, and then we have Biden's policy. So there are a lot of crises which converge on the state, in fact. Well, what powers are we talking about? What state powers? The state is not omnipotent. It's acted recently, but there were lots of failures. It wasn't prepared. It had to improvise, as we all know. France was well prepared. We thought uh, uh, we were in a good position. But apart from the DGA, the ability uh, of the state to do strategic planning seems to have disappeared. So you can wonder about the legitimacy of the state. And there's an awful lot of uh, bureaucracy, there are administrative authorizations, all sorts of uh, red tape was introduced during the crisis. In any event, what one can say is that uh, some things are not at all effective. And over and above that, the state is not alone. It's not the state alone, and often not the state at all, that has managed to solve the problems and the crisis. The state is there with other public players, Europe, uh, regions, cities, agencies, and it's uh, the coordination of the entire system that has to be provided for, and also the private sector. Labs like Pfizer developed uh, vaccines, uh, and they refuse state aid. Companies uh, that set up uh, working from home, it's uh, enterprises that did that, not the state. So uh, there's uh, a lot of doubt as to the ability of the state. Look at recent experience. Should the state be uh, the key player right in the middle of the, the field, and should it have such a wide role? What kind of state do we want to have in the future? A sort of a renewed state, a strategist, a partner, a renewed state, a state that clarifies administrative skills and purview, a state that modernizes management, a strategist sees far ahead and becomes uh, available, as in the past, to plan on infrastructure, be it nuclear or transport, a state that determines the priority in the area of health, energy, digital matters, a state that is concerned with infrastructure. 5G, the electricity grid, and the tax infrastructure, and also education. There's a huge challenge today, which is the uh, educational system, which is working less and less well. I'm sure students would agree with that. France's rank is uh, dropping when it comes to PISA scores. Uh, and uh, look at the uh, uh, scientific research. And that's important for competitiveness. It's important in terms of freedom. We've been invaded by social networks. And I think it's absolutely essential to have really strong, well-equipped citizens. Thank you very much. I'll uh, give the floor to Mr. De La Calle. Of course, when the state is all powerful, it has been in different ways, and it, it differs depending on the part of the world you're in. Mexico has gone through uh, the health crisis. It's experienced it differently from Europe. So from your stance, and don't limit yourself only to the health crisis. You can mention other crises as well. How do you judge the role of the state? Has the state been overly powerful, or has it not been sufficiently powerful? Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here with you. I'll be speaking in French as best I can. I'd like to react to your question. Mexico is run by a left-wing government. We have AMLO as our head, and we have gone through a, a health and economic crisis with the feeling that the state was not there. We're no better off in Mexico. We have a, a rescue package to help households and companies. The government left the market, however, to uh, adjust all by itself and from the health side. Of course, 
uh, hospitals needed support and supplies, but uh, we never had enough masks in Mexico. There was never a lockdown in April and uh, in March. Uh, there was a lot of economic damage, so I read, I wrote an article, and I said we are going through a twofold crisis uh, all uh, by ourselves there's a health crisis and an economic crisis where you don't have help from the state and uh, the president of the mexican republic uh, failed to react much however mexico has close links to the u.s whole segments swathes of the mexican economy depend on the u.s 35 percent of gdp is exports we're the second biggest supplier of the U.S. and the leading commercial partner of the U.S. And a lot of Mexican workers live in the U.S. So there's Trump had a strong rescue plan together with Biden, and that had a huge impact on the Mexican economy in turn. Maybe I can talk about state intervention in more general terms and not just in Mexico. One of the biggest crises before COVID was citizens' perception of uh, the democratic deficit, so to speak, in terms of state intervention. I think it will be very important in the future to find a way to burnish democracy in the eyes of its citizens, to this is very important in the uh, daily life of citizens. Uh, there are a lot of people who are anti-establishment, anti-globalization, as mentioned by Mr. Giraudot and Mr. Ferguson. People have the feeling that they're not in control of their own destiny, and that they are, can't participate in the major decisions uh, to be made by the country. I think it's necessary, therefore, to recognize the important role of local authorities, which need to develop their own rules and regulations based on non-discrimination, for example, and strong scientific uh, basis. In other words, uh, one should uh, respect the principle of subsidiarity. You can't apply subsidiarity in all areas, of course. There are public, state, national assets, uh, which can't be devolved on a local basis. But some measures decided on by Brussels or by Washington, and people feel that there is less and less democracy, and, and the population increasingly rejects this state of affair. I also believe it would be worthwhile to make it possible to have rules and standards on different levels. Despite Brexit, for example, the UK could uh, uh, accept the acquis communautaire while having local British laws as well, just like you have different levels of laws in the US competition. In Well, you could have several different sets of rules that ex coexist instead of trying to ensure that everything converges because citizens feel that uh, it's an imposition to force on them a single set of rules. So the crisis, we should make it possible, should also to, also to reform the intellectual property rights. Protection should be inversely proportional to the size of the market. For example, certain rights are protected throughout the world drugs, for example, it's important to have patents which protect the development of drugs in order to be able to recoup the initial investment. Also, COVID has shown that when it comes to the certification of drugs, the system is far too complex and lengthy, and it discourages innovation. And we could say have saved a lot of patients if we had a more flexible system if there was more risk-taking. And there's another crisis, which I might mention also, which I believe is important. We have this sort of addiction to liquidity. Over the last 20 years, 
central banks have built up more and more liquidity. There's been a growth in expenditure and state intervention. And I think all this together poses a serious risk. The most important impact of COVID may be monetary more than anything else, as opposed to just a health crisis. So how can we actually emerge from this crisis and this addiction to huge cash reserves and liquidity, which has a huge impact on the economy? As the price of assets are impacted, inequalities are growing, uh, some enterprises are increasingly concentrated, interest rates are abnormally low, and I believe you have this relationship between fake news and the way in which markets react to bad news. Currently, in terms of the capital market, bad news uh, is interpreted as being good, and good news is being interpreted as bad. And we're a far cry from the truth, which is a huge problem, because that reduces the credibility of governments. And this is one reason why I think there is this general lack of democracy. So state intervention in the uh, during the pandemic, yes, and when there's an economic crisis. But we have to think about this lack of democracy, which explains these anti-establishment movements and the growth in populism around the world. Thank you. Mr. Ben Moussa, there are two states at work here. You live in one and you're familiar with the other one, and that's Morocco. Do you find that uh, the states are being, have been overpowerful, especially since the pandemic? I think that the pandemic has revealed the necessity to rethink the role of the state. Of course, it's shown how we need a protective state that accompanies citizens, that are responds to emergency situations. But the problem reveals certain trends that were already there, expressing the fact that we probably need more states rather than more state. This is because there are a certain number of phenomena at work. Uh, uh, disruptive technology, it's the material capital that is uh, ruling. And this has an implication in terms of freedom and ethics. Then there are gro global crises, health crises, but uh, there's the change climate crisis. Uh, and uh, you can then we have to think about security and migration. There are geographic crises. Uh, Asia is developing, Europe is trying to get into the right position, then there's Africa emerging. But then there are other realities, identity tensions that we are seeing today. Partly this is because of security issues and, and because of migration, but these are there partly because there are those who lose and those who win. We've got to be very careful and not to consider that there's only one solution to all of these problems. And, and the reality of the state role is a reality that every country, according to its history, the path that it's followed, uh, according to its maturia, maturity, each country has to find the right balance when it comes to the role of the state. I'd like to just evoke uh, Morocco's experience. Uh, um, His Majesty the King, before the pandemic, set up a commission based on a development model. Um, I presided the commission. The report has just been published, and the approach was very participatory for the diagnosis part, for the solutions envisaged, but also for the recommendations uh, put forward in the report. The idea was really to create the right conditions for strong appropriation into the solutions. And the question of the role of the state was a question that was very much present. 
So co-building answers, co-building solutions, but also creating the right conditions for transformation, because transforming the state also supposes that you're going to create uh, the conditions according to which uh, citizens, by what they say, um, create the right conditions, because the state can't just be transformed uh, without that kind of pressure. Of course, it's also important to think about, uh, you know, why you want to transform. Where do you want to go with the transformation? What about the role of the state? If we want to conserve and create uh, well-being among citizens, there's also the question of growth and development. These are not just economic things. There are There is the economic dimension, but there's also a social dimension uh, with everything that that implies. Governance, for example, uh, we've got to have the right uh, mechanisms for appropriation. We also have to have a vision so that, you know, we uh, believe in that opening up to the world. We've got to be able to project ourselves towards a better world, a world that we can contribute to as a state. So in the recommendations of the report that I mentioned, there was a mechanism, a political mechanism for mobilization, a, a development pact. The idea behind the development pact was uh, based on a, the consensus of all stakeholders it was uh, based on a kind of a platform with a vision of a certain number of essential reforms. We considered that the consensus can found a new dynamic movement that uh, encourages uh, consistency and encourages the conditions for uh, implementing a certain number of reforms. The report also recommends the idea of a balance between a state that is strong because of its democratic institutions, but also a plural society that is strong also. So these are the two pillars that when they are under pressure, the right kind of pressure, they can create the right kind of virtuous dynamics. And this uh, takes us back to the idea of a state that uh, reforms itself, that manages uh, areas, geographic and administrative areas, and is able to intelligently um, combine the democratic and the participatory side of uh, its functioning. Thank you. Chloe Morin. The limits of the overpowerfulness of the state, is it up to the citizen to do something about that? Well, this was already brought up uh, several times over the course of the debate. It's true that when you wonder about uh, the state and how overpowerful it might be, you have to think about consent, uh, consent for public decision. This consent is due partly to the question of uh, public action efficiency. And from that point of view, we've there's a real public action crisis not just from an economic point of view, but also from a security point of view. Consent is something that's built by association, by the sharing of power. And it's true that when it comes to France, we've reached a stage where the share of powers between the different institutions is too imbalanced. It's based on deficiency because the powers are too concentrated. They're in the hands of the executive powers to the detriment of a parliament. Lately, we felt that the parliament has constantly lost power. It's lost its, its weight, its clout. So how do we rebuild? How do we recreate something that's efficient? How do we have a better kind of association between the different uh, actors and citizens? The answer is more complex than one might imagine. And that's because 
we tend to say, well, participatory democracy is the solution to all the problems, whereas up until now, you know, the experience in France, but elsewhere, shows that participatory democracy works well, even very well, for one-off subjects uh, and at a, a local area scale. But when we're talking about bigger projects or bigger actions, big actions with bigger scopes, when we're talking about national level or international levels, it's much more difficult to have participatory democracy working. And that's, you know, we never reach the right kind of level of participation. You know, the number of citizens participating in the decision is always limited. So if you're widening the spectrum of people taking part in uh, the decision, maybe that's something to be explored. And there's another thing that needs to be solved, and that is the competition of participatory democracy uh, with representative democracy, which is still the most efficient means to date uh, for controlling public action, coordinating public action. We've seen this with the Citizen Convention for the Climate. This was an initiative whose objective was to build consent for difficult decisions, especially from an environmental point of view. And in fact, straight away, there was a form of competition that emerged between what this convention could do and the role of parliament, which is a sovereign role. It has the monopoly in terms of the law. And the risk when you multiply such participatory initiatives, there is a risk. You take away legitimacy from other institutions, in this case the parliament, without necessarily creating a legitimate institution in place of that institution. I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So, participatory democracy, I think uh, that's a transition for us. We have a representative on the stage with us. How do you see all of that? Yes, we need to ask ourselves this question. You know, what the state does in a society and what the democratic principles are. I'm a representative of participatory democracy. I simply believe in the difference at territorial level, where there's an iteration, where there's a permanent discussion between the participatory authorities and the, the other authorities. We don't do this because of a lack of democratic maturity or constitutional maturity between the parliament and the citizens. The elected officials, and, and I've been one for 26 years, they mustn't fear participatory democracy. It's a source of legitimacy. You know, you don't sign a, a, a check for five years if you don't believe in, in this kind of thing. But just to go back to your question, I, it's not me who can say that the overpowerfulness of the state uh, over the last 18 months is, is legitimate. I'm one of the guys who decided to close bars, to close restaurants, and who started to coat count in billions instead of millions in order to support the economic world. Hopefully we're moving into a better phase today. So you have to you know, wonder about democracy when you do this, when you're among the, the decision makers. If I, must, uh, if I may just uh, say, action, public action is nevertheless a source of humility and empiricism. Four years ago, we elected a president called Emmanuel Macron, who was the biggest representative of liberalism. He was caricatured from that point of view. The president nationalized the French economy, apparently, and got the state to pay two thirds of the assets because he adapted to a situation. And when you've decided to invest so much money to support the economy and social cohesion, it's because you know what the pragmatic, empirical consequences are. Because of 2008, Germany 
uh, was better at supporting the economy through furlough, and f in France it was not as good, not as well done. So in spite of all the problems you've all brought up, these different problems, uh, the things that didn't work, we, we did as best we could, we, we didn't do everything very well. So representation, our representation of public action today is that it was efficient to maintain uh, the economic society uh, afloat. But of course, all of this cannot last, because otherwise, uh, you know, there would be a shift in the t kind of democracy that we're practicing. When the state has so much say in what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, when it has so much say in economic life, then we're drifting. And we, when we look today at the society where we live, You've got a state council that's doing politics instead of the government. It's not taking decisions on constitutional, on, on the constitutional levels. When you take Christine Lagarde, that's people involved in economic policies, when you've got magistrates who are filing complaints uh, against their own justice minister, perhaps you know there's too much power given to uh, state and higher institutions, because that and that will take us off track. It was Lord Acton who said that absolute power can corrupt. So we have to get more democracy back in there, including economic participatory democracy, because. What we can say today to our citizens is that we need you. We're talking about uh, recovery, economic recovery. We've got the biggest challenges ahead of us. We've got to change our industries. We've got the climate change. We've got the question of energy. We can't do anything without you, without all the French people. And we don't say this to people enough. We need people who save money because thanks to them, we can triple the recovery plan. But they have to say yes, but the condition is that let's have some sovereign popular um, funds with a guaranteed capital. We need workers because they accept professional mobility. They ag agree to go towards new jobs that are creating. They might say, yes, but pay us more. Pay the work better in relation to the capital because the distribution of remuneration is profoundly un unfair. Sorry, Mr. Jourdol. Will we say to them, OK, to save the social model in France, we'll probably have to work 10 to 12 months more. Everybody's expecting that because we can't be, you know, the country where we live the longest uh, uh, in good health. But they have to tell us, OK, but wait a minute, solve us that problem, the problem of, uh, you know, granny and granddad and their independence. We can't be the first generation paying for the nursing homes and for uh, our, the, our kids' uh, studies. So we've got to put citizens back into the heart of the situation. I don't know whether we'll manage to do that. Will we, uh, Schumpeter will maybe, Keynes need to be referred to, but you know, everybody needs to be involved. Thank you very much. Christian Saint-Etienne, do you want to uh, say anything? We have to finish five minutes ahead of time because we're a little bit behind. Uh, do you want to come back to the question of, you know, we've we've talked about a lot of themes, but there's an idea uh, that you uh, all ev evoked, you know, what is the just, the right mission of the state? What is it? Now, in what's been said, we've considered the three moments of state invasion before, during and after the crisis. So I was giving a, a speech yesterday about the question of public finance and strategic evolution. The truth is that the difficulties of public finance in France were not caused by the crisis, but by the situation that we had in 2019 before the crisis. When you, we started the crisis, so Germany had an, ex, uh, an excess and we were in a different situation at the end of the crisis. That, that's what we're faced with. We're faced with uh, what was in the coffers. So then there's the question of public action efficiency. I've been dealing with that subject for many, many years. I've debated about it with people who were not in agreement with me with respect to public action scope, efficiency, and little by little, my, I've decided on something. 
that reflects my ideas. If we had 56 points of public expenditure and all the young people had training that was incredible, spoke three languages and found a job straight away, there'd be no insecurity and we would have invented a new model. The problem is that when you have 56 points of public expenditure and you've got insecurity and you've got unemployment more than anywhere else and that you're behind when it comes to digital transformation, it means that your state is inefficient. So that's a central question in France. It has been for 30 years now. Um, we don't address it properly. Maybe the government, uh, maybe the president uh, will ad ad address it uh, through the number of civil servants that we have. There's a, qu a central question that leads us, therefore, to recenter the role of the state. Uh, it, it's not uh, doing the right uh, governing through army, through justice systems, through border control. Border control has to be seen a bit like the skin of the body, you know, some information, some substances need to get through to allow for life. But if you take that skin away, you, uh, you die. So we need to rethink borders. Uh, have we got the right levels? Uh, should we have them at European level? But if so, how do you manage these borders? How do you get them respected? After the crisis, uh, it was Mr. Ferguson who said that we're going to have two problems, a general problem concerning all East, uh, Western states. How do we get the dog into the kennel? The dog is used to biting, uh, taking all kinds of food. The problem, the specific French problem, is that how do we increase the efficiency of the state while keeping in mind the point that was brought up, in other words, participatory democracy. In my opinion, the only, in my opinion, the only way to keep our head above water is to use tools that are not used today in France. We've created intercommunality. We've got 36 municipalities today, 36,000. They're all, there are different intermunicipal organizations, and there's a real question today you know, how do we merge all of the public establishments, water management, waste management? How do we bring it all together? We don't get rid of the basic municipalities, but they should become subdivisions of these inter-municipal organizations. And with a six-month term of office, people would have to do strategic planning of, of catchment areas because this French miracle, you know, nobody does anything. You know, nobody, catchment areas are defined as territories where uh, over 80% of the population work and are cared for. So this miracle is that these intermunicipal organizations correspond to 100% or 90% of the borders of the uh, catchment areas defined by the INSEE organization. So coming back to participatory democracy, that would be good to have these catchment areas for strategic planning. But on the other hand, at national level, uh, with the regions, we need to move on to strategic planning. We need to use models like the DARPA model or the, the BADA model so that we can work, so that companies can work together based on state strategic plans, but which are not executed by civil servants, but by the private sector based on strategies set by the state. So it's this major transformation that we have ahead of us. Hopefully, Macron will move things ahead. We hoped he would, but he hasn't been able to. We hoped that would be the case with Sarkozy, but that wasn't possible. We're hearing that we're going to have more and more crises in the future. So perhaps it's a, a, a fundamental question that we need to ask. You know, if we start with the idea that the next crisis is not in 20 years' time, but in five years' time, and that to reorganize a state action, we've got three to four years, how do we go about things from a political point of view? Notably, 
with the concept of uh, consent uh, brought up by Claire Morand. How do we implement this, this very rapid transformation? We always used to talk about transformation thinking that, you know, we're talking about 15 to 20 years time. The last crisis leads to a transformation in space and time. So how do we get organized so that we can generate the transformations that we, we've known about for 20 years? Because otherwise, we're all just going to die with the next crisis. Thank you very much. I'm perhaps going to ask Mr. Ferguson and then Mr. Lacalle to say just a few words, two sentences, so that everybody can say something. What transformation? I'll answer the, the question raised by Christian Satinien. What are the transformations to be implemented uh, by the state in order to prevent us falling into the same trap, uh, having the same disasters during the next crisis. What do we need to change right away, basically? Mr. Ferguson. Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do in the United States, uh, and it's not what we should do. What we're going to do is pursue a, a series of uh, expensive uh, fiscal measures that will enlarge the scope of the federal government. Uh, and this is based on the illusion, uh, which the crisis has reinforced, that uh, there really are no constraints on the federal government's ability to borrow. So multi-trillion dollar bills are passing through Congress uh, at a time when the economy clearly does not need significant additional fiscal support, and I am one of those who agrees with Larry Summers that this is quite likely, though not certain, to cause the economy to overheat, and when inflation expectations become unanchored, rates will go up and the magic money tree will turn out to be an illusion. What we should be doing as I mentioned earlier, is looking at the successful governments of East Asia, the democracies, Taiwan and South Korea, which use technology to empower states and expedite government response to an emergency. Last sentence. Our highly unwieldy bureaucracies have become steadily worse at disaster management over the past several decades on both sides of the Atlantic, believing that you can solve this problem by making the bureaucracy even larger is one of the great illusions of 2021, which I expect to be shattered very soon indeed, and certainly when the next disaster strikes. Thank you. Well, thank you. This is very, quite gloomy, but very interesting. Uh, C'est très intéressant, mais un petit peu, un petit peu pessimiste, mais pas forcément erroné. So it's it's pessimistic, but not wrong. So, Mr. Lacalle, very quickly, so you can everybody, say, uh, something. Thirty seconds, then. I agree with Larry Summers as well, but I think he's wrong in the in the sense that the Americans, the American authorities are going to accept inflation because the political costs of increasing the interest rates are going to uh, put the brakes on inflation and they're too big. So what's important for the Western economies is how do we face uh, state capitalism of uh, in China? The answer is more democracy, not less democracy. It's not a question of imitating the Chinese systems because they can't be imitated elsewhere. It's about focusing on uh, what we have in the West, uh, democracy. Yeah, Mr. Girardol, no? A very quick transformation, a measure that uh, might be uh, determining. I think it's urgent to clarify the French admin people. It's one of the keys. It's one of the keys for uh, making 
politics more legitimate. The only elections that people are interested in are local elections. They don't they don't care about what happens elsewhere. So we've got to clarify responsibility. We've got to make people make sure that people are closer to the people who are governing them. Thank you very much. So very quickly, very quickly. Yes, sorry, sorry to rush you. Yes, so long time, short time, governmental time, citizen time. This time is a, an essential question. It has to be taken into account in order to reorganize the state. So freeing up energies at territorial level, at, at local area level, that's another important thing if we want to create. We've got to develop people's abilities to act. We've got to create spaces for debate and discussion so that we encourage appropriation, but also to facilitate you know, uh, the implementation of these different transformations. You know, if if they come from the top, um, it won't work. Uh, and the digital field has to be a powerful accelerator. And for you, Chloe Morin. I don't really have a great deal to add in terms of growing bureaucracy and administration. Of course, so. Uh, at each level, things are uh, complex, but we should, in fact, uh, reform the powers that be. Uh, Mr. Mignola, good luck. You have to reform after the crisis. You have to reform between the crisis. For those who indulge in economic policy and who require responsibility in this area, to propose a reform, it has to be uh, perceived as beneficial by people, and you shouldn't aim to be re-elected. If you don't aim at it, it's the best way of being re-elected. Thank you very much.